Oh my gosh. It is like a nice pleasant winter day in the middle of April here in the uh, Orwellian police state lockdown here in Garfield, Texas here on uh, Tuesday, April 14th. 2020 and my name is Sam Mitchell and uh, this is the Collapse Chronicles you have uh, encountered uh, where, well, you know, this is the Collapse Chronicles and the Corona Panic Chronicles. So I am going to start off with this uh, we're going to start off with the Collapse Chronicles. We're going to do today's Chronicle of the Collapse, where we're going to read part of this excellent long essay by this fellow named Sheldon Solomon, who I just became aware of. So we're going to read part of this long essay as today's Collapse Chronicle. Then we're going to come back and read a, yet another part for today's Corona Panic. Chronicle. So we're going to kill two birds with the same stone uh, today. Oh yes, my name is Sam Mitchell and this is my little co-pilot, Sancho Ponza. And I want to thank a Work Tribes member for turning me on to this fellow, Sheldon Solomon, who I am thrilled to say has just today agreed to be interviewed here on Collapse Chronicles. So Sheldon Sheldon Solomon is professor of psychology at Skidmore College where he studies the effects of the uniquely human awareness of death on our behavior. He is co-author of In the Wake of 9-11, The Psychology of Terror and The Worm at the core on the role of death in life. So, uh, and he is a major uh, fellow collapsitarian. I don't know when this uh, excellent, this is like a 20 page, 15 page uh, spot on essay, which we're gonna break into two parts. And even then, I'll only barely scratch the surface. So I'm going to put the link on here. But the name of this, I wish we had a date on it. I think it's recent, though. Death Denial in the Anthropocene. And he starts out with a quote by biologist E.O. Wilson. <clears throat> quote, Humanity today is like a walking dreamer caught between the fantasies of sleep and the chaos of the real world. The mind seeks but cannot find the precise place and hour. We have created a Star Wars civilization with Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. We thrash about we are terribly confused by the mere fact of our existence and a danger to ourselves and the rest of life. Thank you, Brother EO. Okay, this is the first paragraph of uh, Sheldon's uh, treatise, and then we're going to move down to the middle of it. <clears throat> Just to start off, History is replete with examples of society reduced to rubble by wars, toxic demagoguery, environmental degradation, and seemingly insatiable material consumption, which is what we're going to talk about in this video. Moreover, social collapses can occur abruptly in the midst of seemingly auspicious conditions. The Anthropocene, however, is unprecedented in that human-induced climate instability, rampant population growth, and its associated resource depletion 
sophisticated weapons of mass destruction, political instability amplified by the rapid proliferation of information and misinformation technology, and the obligatory interdependence of a globalized economy are such that it is entirely possible that we will have the ignominious distinction of being the first form of life to be directly responsible for our own extinction by rendering the planet unfit for human habitation. There you go. So that is how he kicks off this, uh, th th that's how he kicks off this 15 page story, but we're going to jump down about halfway for, no, actually towards the end of it. Uh, we're going to come back to the middle of it for our coronavirus chronicle, and I don't think I ever mentions the words coronavirus, uh, but we're going to head down to uh, pretty much the bottom here and talking about lethal consumption, lethal consumption, and we're going to start out with a quote from Tennessee Williams in his play Cat on a Hot Tin Roof from 1940. Uh, I think this was Big Daddy. I think this was Burl Ives' character, Big Daddy. Not sure about that. Tennessee Williams wrote it. <clears throat> Quote, The human animal is a beast that dies and he's gotten that the human animal is a beast that dies, and if he's got money, he buys and buys and buys. And I think the reason he buys everything he can buy is that in the back of his mind, he has the crazy hope that one of his purchases will be life everlasting. <laughs> Sorry, Big Daddy. Ain't gonna happen for you. Okay. Back to Sheldon. Plundering the environment is also the inevitable result of humankind's seemingly insatiable desire for money and stuff. Classical economist C. G. Becker from 1978 typically view money as a symbol that people rationally employ to exchange goods and services. They also assume that people amass material possessions in the service of addressing satiable needs and desires. Ernest Becker argued, however, that money and material possessions have always had and still have sacred connotations with intimations of immortality, and this is why people seem to have an insatiable desire for infinite amounts of both. Money originated in religious rituals. In ancient Greece, families held communal feasts to honor their heroic ancestors who they believed had the power of immortal gods and could thus offer protection, advice, and direction. Coins bearing the image of ancestors that were used to gain admittance to the feast were highly valued because they were believed to confer the same magical powers as the ancestors themselves. As anthropologist Jesus Romine put it, originally people do not desire money because you can buy things for it, but you can buy things for money because people desire it. Uh, <laughs> I would have to read that several times to uh, tease that one apart, but we've got to move on. Uh, anyway, money confers supernatural power, so do material possessions. For centuries, Native American tribes in the Pacific Coast from Oregon to Alaska 
held potlatches on special occasions to display their wealth, after accumulating excess resources, wealthy families hosted celebrations that began with dancing, singing, speeches, and feasting. For several days, guests were showered with an immodest barrage of gifts. The guests were in turn obligated to hold their own potlatches to reciprocate and escalate the exchange. The primary objective of the potlatch, quote, was to create an impression of an endless supply of wealth. In contemporary Western society, potlatch-like behavior persists in the form of conspicuous consumption. More Americans shop on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, than who vote in presidential elections. According to one account, quote, on the day after Thanksgiving 1999, the San, the San Antonio Express News reported that thousands of shoppers began lining up outside of Walmart's Best Buys and Targets at 2 a.m. for the new tradition of after Thanksgiving shopping. The newspaper reported that most shoppers said they had no idea what they wanted to buy. They were simply lured out by the promise of sales. Research demonstrates that death anxiety underlies the insatiable desire for money and stuff. High death anxiety is associated with materialism and consumption. Participants who viewed death most negatively reported being more materialistic than those who viewed death more positively as the natural end to life. Another study found a significant positive correlation between death anxiety and brand name consumption, i.e. endorsement of, quote, I try to stick to well-known brand names and I prefer to buy products with designer names and compulsive consumption, i.e. endorsement of, I frequently buy things even when I can't afford them and I am an impulse buyer. In response to a death reminder, people were more eager to buy expensive luxury items such as a Lexus and Rolex and reported higher estimates of their overall worth and greater intended future expenditures on clothing and entertainment. In response to a death reminder, people ate more cookies, smoked more cigarettes, and purchased more alcohol. Uh, and, he, and he links you to all of these different studies uh, testing this out. Additionally, participants reminded of their mortality reported higher monetary standards for what would define someone as wealthy and demanded greater compensation for deferring immediate payment of money. Moreover, just counting a stack of money relative to counting a stack of paper reduced death anxiety. So what is the future of life in the Anthropocene. He starts out with a quote, come to terms with death. Thereafter, anything is possible. That would be from Albert Camus. Okay, but wrapping up this 20-page uh, uh, essay, uh, this is how Solomon wraps it up. Human survival in the Anthropocene 
will require coordinated efforts by cognitively nimble and emotionally intelligent individual and state actors willing to explore a wide variety of political, economic, technical, and religious approaches to fostering a sustainable future. This would be a tremendous challenge even under ideal conditions. However, as the environment deteriorates, conflicts over natural resources accelerate. Economic inequality and instability escalates. Political volatility and ideological demagoguery intensifies, and it becomes increasingly apparent that cultural worldviews dedicated to the inevitability of progress via continuous growth within a globalized multinational market economy is unsustainable, there will likely be a commensurate increase of death anxiety. Like a natural mortality salience induction, this will in turn make people even more hateful, warmongering, proto-fascist, alienated from nature, and plundering the environment in a drug, alcohol, shopping, television, Facebook, Twittering stupor which does not bode well for humankind's prospects in the Anthropocene. Perhaps, however, Albert Camus was correct in his observation in The Plague that, quote, quote, we learn in times of pestilence that there are more things to admire in men than to despise, close quote. And while it may be far-fetched to claim that coming to terms with death will make anything possible, perhaps recognizing the pervasive and pernicious effects of death anxiety on human affairs will, as Ernest Becker hoped, quote, introduce just that minute measure of reason to balance destruction. Oh yes, and uh, <laughs> so anyway guys, that should give you a little bit of a background of, uh, of this long treatise on death anxiety and what it means for global industrial civilization and ultimately the planet. But we're going to come back to this <clears throat> honk of the middle of this where, uh, where Sheldon Solomon, I think without ever mentioning the word coronavirus, nails it about the corona panic and death anxiety and the corona panic. So that will be uh, <clears throat> coming up in one minute in the Corona Panic Chronicles. If you enjoyed this version of the Collapse Chronicles, please give Sheldon a thumb up and subscribe when you're over here. And look forward to my interview with Sheldon Solomon coming out sometime in the next few weeks. I think I already have three in the pipeline, so it might be a couple of weeks before we get to Sheldon. Bye, guys.